Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Michael Williamson, CEO at IO Education. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm excited. You, you guys are doing some really interesting stuff, and but maybe kind of before we get into IO Education, let's get to know you a little bit better and kind of cover your background. So maybe um, let's start off with where you grew up. Sure, yeah. So I'm a native uh, Atlantan, so I grew okay. up around here in Atlanta. Very cool. So um, went to high school here and went to University of Georgia in Athens. Okay, so what, what did you take in university? So I studied computer science. I've always been into software, and um, so that's that's what I went after at, at UGA. Okay, so what got you kind of passionate about wanting to go into the space? So so I've always been focused, uh, I've always been passionate about software development, obviously. That's okay. what I studied. And then we kind of um, fell into a niche in K K through twelve education, where we're we're you know focused on building applications for school districts, and okay. so that's really my the first company that we started. It was family business that my dad started. Okay, we were focused in education. Okay, so you've been in, exposed to it for a long time. Then. Right. Okay. Very cool. So you got out of university. Kind of, what did you end up doing? Family business stuff, or where did you end up going? So my dad started a, a software company in, in the early 90s Okay, when when software was really kind of just starting. You know, you could sure. really start buying software, packaged software. So we we had a big ERP application around, like, supply chain management. Sure. So I graduated and uh, and immediately joined that, that business, which is really just starting up at that time. Okay, so what was your role at that company? And what was the company called? So that company was Horizon Software. Okay, yeah. We're still around today and, and doing well. Very cool. So I started in just as a, as a programmer, software developer. Okay. What language, out of curiosity, at the time? So that was an old DOS-based product. So Dataflex was, oh, okay. the, was the language. And then we moved to Fox Pro. So right, right. really old stuff. Sure. That, that's yeah. awesome, though. I, I love to hear about kind of what people were doing back in back then, right? Because it's, it's fascinating, right? Because... If you can program, you can program in any language. Right. The concepts are the same. It's just like, what syntax do you write, right? Exactly. So, it's, so I'm, I'm curious then, do you still ever dabble in programming at all? Or, or? Unfortunately, no, I don't. Okay. And, and, I, and I really love it. Um, so I've always been you know, very much a technology guy. Sure. So I went from being a programmer to kind of managing a small team and sure. kind of worked my way up. And so I don't actually get to code anymore, but I'm still very much involved on the tech side with our with our business today. Sure, and, and I think it's super important or and helpful that you understand kind of how to code, even if you're not coding. Right. Because, and I, I like coming from the design side, I can code my own stuff, and it's super important because when you're designing features or coming up with new ideas, you're like, well. No, that's not buildable. Right. Right. And right. so you can save a lot of time because there's a lot of things where somebody that doesn't understand how to code can come to you and say, I want all these things. And you're like, well, sure, so do I. But yeah. we can only do three quarters of those or, or whatever that number is. Right? right. And so having kind of a technical coding background, even if you don't code all the time, is still very useful, even if it's languages that aren't used today. Yeah, it definitely helps to, to kind of manage the expectations of what you want the team to do. Sure. I think any SaaS software entrepreneur, kind of the, in my opinion, the two things that would, would are ideal to have is a really good understanding of engineering of how that works, like you said, and then also on the sales side, sure. like understanding how to sell the product, which oftentimes are not they don't go hand in hand. Sure. So you, either you have one or the other, but it's good to have both. Sure. So you were at Horizon for a long time. Right. So kind of walk me through the process. Like you started there as a programmer. How did you, you kind of moved up the chain. Yeah. Kind of talk through, talk me through that process because there's a lot of people that I talk to, you know, that are, I, that basically are, you know, maybe at the tail end of being millennial, maybe into their late thirties, into their forties now that have been kind of started as a programmer and moved totally out of that. Right? right, right. So so I was very fortunate in that I grew up in an entrepreneur house, sure. you know, as a kid. So, you know, I always knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to have my own software company one day. Sure. So when I started, I started as a programmer. 
uh, and it was again it was a family business so I was working for my dad and sure. he, he wanted me to get exposure to all that different parts of the business so I got you. you know I managed the development team for a while then I managed customer service I was in sales I was okay. in marketing I worked in all areas of that business and it really grew like we started at with you know one person and when I left we were like 200 people wow so it really scaled and so I, I was very fortunate that I got to work in every area of that business over about 16 years sure and when I started IO you know I, I really had a great understanding of you know what it took to kind of build an organization in all those areas sure and especially being in those you you could fully almost say like well back I was there one day yeah right? so you you understand their problems why they have them why they're coming to you I, I think that's super valuable right so let's cover what exactly is IO education and kind of what made you kind of leave and do your own thing? Yeah, so um, so I was running Horizon as CEO. Again, it was a big, it was a bigger software company, um, and we were acquired in 2008 by a big public company. So okay. I was I was really running a division of a public company, which was a whole different environment from a startup, you know, entrepreneur. Sure. So I got a great experience there, but I really wanted to go back to building a company really from scratch and really the fun part of a business is that you know zero to 50 employees you know sure. that you you come up with an idea you get a couple people building it and then you kind of try to scale it from there so I, so about five years ago i started that and we were really focused in education around analytics so how okay. can we how can we provide a way for educators that are teaching students to better use all of this data that they have access to. So that was the original premise of, of what we started. Okay, so dot, walk me through kind of exactly what you're doing by collecting this data and what are you using the data for? Yeah, so, and I, I didn't really appreciate this till we got in, but the job of a teacher is very difficult. Sure. Very challenging. So they've got a lot of different demands on them, but we collect a huge amount of data on students in schools. Okay. You know, I would argue probably more data than any other part of our culture because they're there eight hours a day, 200 days a year. So we're collecting attendance data and discipline data and grades and assignments and all kinds of test quiz scores. Sure. And the challenge is, is that bits of that data is tracked across a bunch of different products. So a teacher okay. may use... At the school, you mean? At the school okay. level. Okay. So they may use 10 or 15 different apps to collect all this data. So they don't have a really good way to go to one place to visualize all of this data to kind of get a holistic view of that student or their you. group of students. Okay. So we really try to solve that problem. How can we bring all the data together and then visualize it in a way where they'll actually you know, be able to use it? Okay, so when you say use it, what does that really mean to the actual user? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the the goal is you really want to personalize the instruction for each individual student. So sure. so every student is every kid is different. You know, they have individual strengths and weaknesses, and if we know what those strengths and weaknesses are, we can take those very specific weaknesses and the teacher can personalize what they do oh, for each individual student so so they can get a better education basically. yeah they can get okay. a more direct cool. individualized experience sure that that's <clears throat> very cool so walk me through the process of trying to pull data from all these systems that sounds like it could be quite challenging because there's probably different APIs, if they, yeah. maybe they don't have any APIs, or if they do, maybe they're not documented very well yes. at all. <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge challenge, and that's, that's, really, that's really the biggest part of our work is that challenge. So we sure. spent the first year and a half really building out a data platform that okay. could extract data out of these different apps and bring it into this common data warehouse. Sure. And we do it, we extract a bunch of different ways from direct API to you know, we export out Excel files okay. or CSVs and bring those in. Okay. So a lot of different ways, but that's, that's the real first challenge and step. And then the second challenge is educators are really not like analytics people. They're, I got you. what they're great at is build, building relationships with students. So they don't want to use Excel and they don't like report. So sure. the other challenge was how do we create an engaging UI to uh, w that they'll actually enjoy using. Sure. So <clears throat> walk me through the process of building that UI. 
I'm assuming you did a bunch of testing and research and showing teachers or, or kind of how did you come up with the proper UI? Yeah, so, you know, coming from more of a technical background, I was not a teacher ever. Okay. So what we did, and we were very fortunate that our first school customer was a, a school in Boston. Okay. A national blue ribbon school of excellence. And so this principal there was fantastic. So we, we literally flew up there week after week really? after week for many weeks. And we actually just sat in their meetings and we watched what they did and how they used data. And okay, they, they basically had a board in a room like this and they would put post-it notes and, and magnets and they would move these students around almost like in a tile type structure. Okay, interesting. And so, um, and they spent a lot of time doing that. So we built our interface based on that experience and really tried to match that, how they were actually doing it. And subsequently we've went, we've gone into hundreds of, of thou, you know, thousands of schools sure. and they're all pretty much doing very similar thing of how they use data. Sure. That, that's actually very cool and it's, it's, it's very interesting how people kind of make those decisions and I love the fact that you basically went there and watched them. You weren't saying like, let's take our best guess at this because I think if you don't, if you guys never would have seen that, the interface would have looked totally different right. from that. Right. Right. And I think that's super important to kind of just stress to kind of the listener because like coming from a design background, well, any UX person, it's they're taking their best guess at it unless they go there right. or really do their research to actually build the proper interface. And and so I, I'm curious then, so you build a web interface? Right. We built a web uh, web interface, so it's okay. all web-based. We do have sure. a couple native iOS apps sure. that are part of it as well. Uh, Android as well or just iOS for now? Uh, both, okay. Android and iOS. So how did you go about laying out the data on you know these smaller screens yeah so you know one of the things that we learned about teachers is that what they relate to are are those student uh, relationships so so we wanted to build our whole interface to data around the picture of the student so okay. these tiles that we use and they're very animated in, in the ui are all uh, you know the child's face, okay. and so we kind of mocked up that that interface. And you know, my advice to anybody is, get in front of that user as early as possible sure. in the process to watch what advice. they do, and then get feedback. And so we iterated through it, you know, through that process. When you get into the mobile devices, obviously our interface on a web app. Sure. is different than it is on a phone sure. and so you know we you have to kind of scale down the functionality and so we ask you know we ask teachers if you were to look at this on a native phone app what information would you want to see and okay. and so we we really changed the the what we were delivering on mobile versus web and not try to just duplicate it sure i i, I love that because traditionally I, i'm kind of of the mindset that you you should deliver the same experience on both, but in certain cases, you can't. And if you do, you make the experience worse. And I think you, you guys right. would fall in that case. And, and I love the fact that you went to the user and you said, okay, like, what do you need on your phone? What do you need on the desktop? And let's cut features so we can give you a better experience right. on the actual device that you're using, right? right? And if you need certain bits of data, you go to the, your laptop or where, whatever, right. you know. So, so that makes a lot of sense. So I'm kind of curious to know, okay, so you collect this data, you present it. So what, what does the teacher really gain from this? Yeah, so, so a couple things. Um, you know, first, the first step is that we want to provide the teacher the insights of okay. that data. So sure. it should tell the teacher that if you're looking at, okay, I'm, I'm, I have 100 students that I interact with every day. Sure. We need to know which one of those students are maybe struggling in reading comprehension. I got you. Which ones are doing really well. So that's kind of the first step. We want to give them that, that information. And then the second part of it is data should lead you to take action. You know, so if you just sure. provide data just for to look at data, it's not really valuable. So we have the ability right from the data experience to create that personalized plan for each student. So we say these 20 students are struggling in reading comprehension. Let's create a plan for what we're going to do for them over the next 90 days. Okay. So we're connecting the action to the data. Sure. So now that you have all this data and I, I guess 
big data is probably the I get big data is kind of just a buzzword because it's just data. There's mm-hmm. just lots of data, so we call it big data. At least how, that's how I would put it, right? But so you have all this data now. So you must be able to find a lot of really interesting stuff across the nation because you have all these school districts using it. Right. So is there anything that you've gathered from this data that is kind of surprising that you that you never thought you would never thought of really that you learned? You're like, oh wow, that's really quite interesting. Yeah, a couple things. I mean, um, we've been very focused at kind of where it really matters in education, and that's in the classroom. So we're providing tools there. But at a macro level, and we we have a couple million students on our platform already, so we've got a, you know, pretty good scale. And you start to learn, uh, you know, a couple things. You know, what is the profile of students that – you know, are at high risk. So we do a lot of work around dropout prevention, for example. Okay, very cool. So if we can predict in seventh and eighth grade, which kids are most likely going to drop out. Interesting. We can intervene now. Sure. And and make a difference before they get 15 or 16 years old. So there's, there's some interesting, and there's a lot of research on this, but, and we've seen it play out in our, in our uh, schools that you have predictor measures. So attendance, if you, ha- if you're out of school a lot or you're tardy a lot, right? that that's a predictor. If you're getting in trouble, like detentions or suspensions, sure. you know, that's a predictor. And of course, if you, if you fail a course, and so if you have all three of those, you are at very high risk for dropout, you know, maybe three or four years down the road. I got you. If you have one of the three, you know, and, and so we, we know that early and then we can plan interventions in order to, to help those kids, you know, get better. Sure. So when you say plan interventions, do you just pop up like an alert to the teacher or how do you kind of notify the user? Yeah, so, you know, we do alerts or, okay. you know, in this reporting process where, where they have kind of standard meetings weekly or monthly where they're talking about their students, they use our, our products to, you know, look at their students to say, you know, they're high risk in these areas or they're, or they're low risk and, and they go from there. So does, like, the principal have a different version of, like, the entire school or, or how does that kind of work? Like, how, what are the levels, I guess? Yeah, so we've built different views of data based on the different levels. So a okay. principal would see more of an aggregate maybe high level view but they I could drill you. in okay a teacher is looking you know student sure. student by student very detailed okay. um, data so different views and then is there a level above kind of the principal that you know like the district know, man- district man uh, administration are, yeah, team like go. superintendents yeah yeah okay so they have a, their own kind of view as well right and then i don't is there like a nationwide kind of school board that could see everything or not really not really i mean we we do have a couple customers that are states state department of education so we'll have like wisconsin alabama we have every district in that state using one of our products and so there is roll-up information where you can kind of see trends of this district is a high performer this district's a low performer and we can kind of look at the differences and see why sure and then i'm assuming then too you could basically say well this curriculum is doing bad across the entire state, so you should probably look at changing it because students aren't getting it or they're failing right. or, or whatever, or it's too easy. Right. So they can modify based on kind of this statewide data. And I think um, schools are, are starting to get into like the tech space, for lack of a better term, because they have to. Right. Because they want this data. It's not that they, they're against it. It's just now they can actually get it, right? Yeah. And they're trying to make it better. They're trying to make it more relevant because we're trying to prepare kids for the future that we don't even know what the future is really going to be, right? right? And so if we can use data to at least help take educated guesses of where things are going to be or help them not drop out because there's a lot of kids that probably have a huge potential, but you know maybe they messed up on a couple tests and they failed a class and drop out where, you know, if you can prevent that, I think that's super awesome. Yeah. And it's just, it's just finding that out early and and teachers are really good at, uh, you know, building those relationships with the students and, you know, knowing what the right thing to do for each individual student. Sure. What we're trying to do is to make it more efficient to get that data in a usable format for them where they can really take action. And then, you know, at a higher level, there is some exciting opportunity around where you could take this data and say, 
you know, maybe across a really big district like sure. um, New York City, where we have 600 schools that oh, use wow. our. That's and awesome. so you could say across those 600 schools, who are the best teachers that really impact second grade English language learners? Okay. And answer that question because if we knew who those teachers were and the, you know the strengths of the teachers, we may want to match students up with those teachers and so there's other uses for data that are that are exciting opportunities but you know our main focus has been on how can we make it the job of a teacher more efficient and easy in the use of data sure no that that makes a lot of sense and i i think that's awesome that you can you can do all this stuff with data now right so i'm kind of curious to know um what what's the cost of this like how do you guys monetize this whole solution yeah, so we we offer a bunch of different kind of products in our portfolio okay. that are that are priced differently, but sure. you know, kind of so we price by the student per year. I so got you. one of my goals when I started this company is this kind of technology is traditionally very expensive. You think sure. about data warehousing, totally. Oracle, Cognos, you know, very expensive yep. projects. Part, partly due to the licensing fees of those licensing storage, fees are big you know, of yeah. Oracle and, and the services involved yeah. to integrate the data. Totally. You know, so the vast majority of the market, you know, ninety percent of the school districts in America are eight schools or less. So they're really? these small okay. rural okay. districts and they don't have huge budgets. Sure. So our normal kind of list price is around five dollars per student oh, per wow. year. So it's pretty inexpensive. It's very sure. expensive, and you know I think, in a, I think we we spend on average about fifteen thousand dollars per school per student per year total for education. Okay, interesting. So this is around five five bucks a year per student. Sure. So I'm curious then because you're going into probably a market that's a little bit hard to sell technology to because there's people that have been there. For decades don't want to change maybe maybe even they do want to change but they're not technical and they're just kind of scared of technology how do you kind of you know get the platform into their hands and kind of turn them into customers and you don't have to give me everything but i just know there's a lot of people struggling with that problem where they have this piece of technology that would really help this industry right. but the people working that are, are traditionally maybe not tech savvy want to be or want to change you right. have any tips or advice for that yeah, so in education, it's tough because it's a long sales cycle. It's all sure. committee buying, so you have to get multiple people on board. Okay. And, you know, it's it's hard to get in. So, you know, I think in general at a high level, you want to be able to get your message out there with multiple touch points. So you, okay. you're not just going to cold call someone one time and get them and convert them to a demo. You have to combination of email outreach you know to get get them to to say i'll spend 45 minutes with you to see what your product can do to help us i got you and so we spent a lot of time on that on the messaging to to get them to really just spend 45 minutes with us and then once we can do that then you know we've spent a lot of time on really you know showing the value of what we do whether it's dollars saved or efficiencies gained our you know io our our name is all about improving outcomes so we have data around if you use this product ideally your students are going to have better outcomes whether that be graduation rate or a better attendance or better test scores sure so we've got a lot of data around that so do they get more money from the state the better their general student population does in some states, in some cases. So, okay. for example, like funding in California okay. is directly tied. A part of, part of their funding is to, uh, tied to attendance. I got you. So if they if kids are attending every day, they get more funding. I so, attendance interventions is is a big deal there. Sure. And if you can save them, or well, I guess in your case, you're not really saving. You're saving. You're getting them more money by making sure that their students are showing up and, and right. other things. That makes right. a lot of sense. Okay, very cool. Right. So I'm kind of curious, do you guys usually do kind of trade shows or how do you kind of, okay, I get you market and you multiple touch points, but where do you do that? I mean, you mentioned email, but do you guys go to trade shows? Do you do kind of other things on and offline? Like, what do you do? In- yeah, we do We do trade some trade shows. There's okay. a lot of trade shows in education, every sure. state and national. So we do some of those, and okay. some of them are very good. Okay. 
Um, we found that uh, there's some trade shows where you get you can book meetings with attendees and, and there's a set number of them where you. we can really spend more time to tell our story. Those are very effective for us. Okay. Um, so we do that. We also do other events like we do a big national expo where we'll bring in our customers oh, okay. as well as prospects. We'll do sessions and um, it, so that that works really well. And then, you know, we also do webinars, like we'll okay. promote, we're going to do a 45-minute session on a, a particular topic, try to get leads that way. I got you. So we, we do a, a lot of different different things. So when you're looking for who to reach out to at these schools or districts or, or whatnot, are, are, do you find a lot of those people are on, you know, social media or LinkedIn, or do you have to kind of use other channels to figure out who to contact at, at the different, you know, places? It, social media is growing in education, okay. um, more so at the classroom teacher level, which is typically not our buyer sure. than, than the higher level administrators, but it, it's, it is becoming more useful. The good thing about education is all of its public information. So we have a really good database of every school, every school district, who are the top five administrators, what their name, right. email, ad, uh, phone number is. So we have pretty good data, contact database sure. um, okay. for, for the market. Interesting, because I was going to ask you for tips on that, because people struggle with that all the time, right? right. These industries where the people aren't really online, like they don't have LinkedIn profiles. And yeah, like right. you said, maybe the teacher has a classroom Twitter account, but you're not selling to them, right? right? Well, you are, but they're not the decision maker, right? right? Yeah, yeah, okay, very cool. So I'm kind of curious to know, where do you see the company really going? Because you're collecting all this data, and it sounds like you could add almost like an infinite amount of features based on this data. So where do you kind of see the future? So it's, it's a really exciting time in education where the, 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 the market and the and educators are moving to, how can we be more personalized in our approach to, to educating each individual student? Sure. Um, and so, the demand for for these data tools and data management platforms is is gaining a lot of momentum. You know, school districts today don't have really robust tools that do what we do and, sure. and to take all this data together. So we think there's a lot of growth in just um, taking our existing platform and, and getting it out to as many districts as we can. Sure. And then the other area that we're focused on is what are some, you know, strategic products that that we can complement our data platform that collects data so sure. we're adding an assessment platform where we okay. can provide our own tests we've got a really nice grade book application that okay. um, teachers use so um, so there's a lot of uh, great exciting opportunity with just how the market is is changing sure are, are you have you thought about doing anything for parents of these students yeah, so a big part of our uh, of our app is parent access. Okay. So not only do we, we want to give educators access to this data, but ideally the parent and students. Sure. So we have a product um, that, you know, we get heavy usage, like 5 million logins a month. Wow. Where parents and students go online to, you know, submit homework or view their grades, view their test scores, okay. and, and have access to that data. Sure. So what does the parent see compared to the student i guess like they could they both probably see grades but there's got to be more for the parent than the student well and that really depends on the school so the okay. school the school can kind of uh configure the 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 application to set to say out of these 50 data points i want to share these 10 with my with you. our parents okay. so they can kind of pick and choose that the students have a little more functionality because they're submitting assignments sure. they're okay. doing their homework um, and and so you know it's a little bit more but but at the end of the day the teachers and the school administrators have control of what what they want the parent to have access you. to no that's that's very cool so i'm curious because like that's something I would love. Like my daughter's a year and a half, so she's not going to school for a number of years, but like that part really appeals to me that I could see, oh, like she's struggling in reading or oh, whatever right. it is, right? right? And I could deal with it now or the second I get notified than waiting a year or two years where she falls really far behind, right? That's right. And so I think having that access because data doesn't lie, right? right. And so it doesn't really matter my opinion if I think, well, no, she's reading fine. But if like clearly she's not, right? Right? Like I can catch that right away. And I think that's super important. And so just for, for people out there, I, I'm curious to know 
kind of what other kinds of things can you provide parents that, you know, probably they aren't even thinking about that, you know, data could really help them? Yeah, so just a personal story. When I first started this company, uh, this was very influential in what we built. My own okay. daughter was in kindergarten, so okay. uh, we were new to, to schools. Sure. And uh, the the life of a student from kindergarten to third, fourth grade, when they're learning how to read, is really sure. the most critical part of their of their life. So, sure. you know, we went to a, our first parent teacher conference or second one with our team, and we had a fantastic teacher. And she said, you know, Haley's really struggling in these reading concepts, and here's what we want you to do at home. So she okay. gave me a list. She gave us a list of, you know, go buy these games, go these books, do this at home. Sure. So we had a, we had a page of those things. And then she said, here's what we're going to do at school. She's going to go to a specialist once a week and here are the things we're going to do. Sure. But basically we had a plan, a written plan as an outcome of that conversation. Okay. And of course we went out and did all of that. And then we went back at the end of the year and said, and she said, Haley has completely uh, turned this, turn the situation around and now she's an accelerated reading program so what really struck with me is that if we can identify those things early and we give involve the parent and and come up with that written plan and execute that plan great things are going to happen for students that's awesome and so as a parent if you can have that information of course you're going to go out and do all of that uh, right away so that's really what's important is that you know teachers really know what these things as long as they know like what what areas they're struggling they can come up with what the plan is involve the parent and great things are going to happen sure no that makes a lot of sense and I, I think that's super useful right and i think it's only like as you collect more and more data the results and like the outcomes are only going to get better right right and there's probably things that like once you collect another year of data you're like oh, this whole new kind of thing opens up here. Like now we can really build this new feature. And you might not even be thinking about that feature right, right now, but the fact that you have all this data, it like that's kind of where I think everything's going to go at some right. point, right? Or just- yeah, and there's, there's a balance. You know, there's a, in, like in every industry, there's a big um, discussion around student data privacy. Like sure. this data is really, really uh, important and it needs to be safeguarded in private which is all, you know, we focus a lot of time on that. Sure. But this data used properly can do incredibly amounts of good things for students and good work. So that's what we're trying to allow educators to to be able to better use this data, better have access to it, uh, because we know they're going to do great things with it. Sure. And you can anonymize the the person and whatnot. You you almost don't care about the student's name or... Right. You might, like, you might, I guess, maybe potentially like parts of the city they live in just so you can compare them or or whatnot but the actual like physical person doesn't really matter when you're looking at it in the aggregate view yes yeah exactly okay. when you're when you're developing an individualized plan for a student sure. obviously you're doing that for sure. a specific student yeah but at a macro level you're exactly right yeah. the you know the uh, you're just looking at kind of broad results sure but michael we're kind of coming to the end of this so i'm i'm kind of curious let's kind of wrap up the show with kind of promoting where people can find you guys online and any other kind of social media stuff that you want to mention. Yeah, so we're, we're easy to find. We're just at ioeducation.com, um, Twitter at ioeducation, LinkedIn. Um, so we're in all those channels and a uh, ton of information about all the different things that we do out, out there. Perfect. Well, Michael, again, thanks again for doing this. I really appreciate it. I look forward to kind of seeing where you guys take this in the future. And, uh, you know, thanks again for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Perfect. Thanks for listening. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com. And keep building the future.